All right. So if you want to open your Bibles to the fourth chapter of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4 is where we are. We finished up uh, the first three chapters already, and there's three chapters to go, chapters 4, 5, and 6. Uh, we're going to get into 4 tonight. We'll make, a little, we'll make a bit of a dent in chapter 4, and then when we pick it up, I'll review a few things. We'll get right back into it. Without, we won't miss a lick, all right? We'll get right into it without any problem whatsoever, all right? And so let's, uh, we've already prayed, so we'll just go over here to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And uh, I'm going to read to you uh, the first, uh, let me see, we'll read the first uh, uh, seven verses. Everybody ready? All right, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. We'll read those, then we'll go to our notes as we normally do, and we'll pick up from there. So it reads this way. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry, I'm at verse 3, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Verse 6, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed but reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. And so that's probably as far as we're going to get tonight as far as uh, through the verses. So let's go to our notes now. And we see here this is part 10 already, part 10 of 1 Timothy. It's hard to imagine, hard to believe. Uh, in 1 Timothy, we've already done, we're on part 10. So uh, let's start with, uh, as it says in Romans, Roman number, number 1, exposition of chapter 4, verse 1 again. We're going to spend some time on this verse, all right? Verse 1, it reads this way again. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, your Bible might say uh, seducing spirits, and doctrines of demons. Now, number one, now the Spirit expressly says, what does that mean? Paul, I'm reading from the notes, Paul is sensing strongly from the Holy Spirit the things he's about to write. The New Living Translation reads this way, now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly. And so again, this is prophetic. The Holy Spirit, this is something, uh, you know, uh, scholars are not sure. There's no way for us to be absolutely sure how the Apostle Paul uh, was able to say the Spirit is uh, expressly saying or clearly saying. Uh, we'll get to that in a few moments. But for whatever reason, there was something on the inside of him. The Holy Spirit on the inside of him uh, was either uh, communicating this with him or he was uh, bearing witness with prophetic words that had already come in the past because there were prophetic words uh, that in the last days there would be uh, the, those that would depart from the faith. And so let's read on with this. As we see here, uh, Dr. Bob Utley writes this. This may refer to one Old Testament prophecy where at times it talks about apostasy. Apostasy is another word uh, for departing from the faith, right? Apostasy being apostate apostate departing from the faith and so again it could be from old testament prophecy number two paul is the recipient of direct inspiration from the spirit uh, i tend to lean that way uh, but again it was something that the word of god had already did, uh, said and, and you know sometimes whenever the holy spirit gives us inspired things and whenever he guides us it's always got to line up with scripture anyway right and so again i think that probably was the case with the apostle paul and then or three inspired messages from other gifted teachers as like x uh, 21 in verse 11, that's uh, uh, with a prophet that is spoken of in the book of Acts by the name of Agabus. Now, number two, that in the latter times, this is the Spirit, this is what the Spirit is clearly saying or expressly saying, that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. Latter times, this is understood as being synonymous with the phrase last days. You know, sometimes uh, people ask the question, are we in the last days? Well, the answer to that is yes, we are in the last days. In fact, we've been in the last days ever since Jesus came about 2,000 years ago. Biblically speaking, we are in the last days because the entire age of the church, uh, about 2,000 years ago, Jesus came, His first coming. Uh, that was the beginning of what the Bible refers to as the last days. So we are in the last days. And some of you have heard me uh, say before, the question really is, are we in the last of the last days, right? And nobody knows that for absolute certainty. We suspect that that could be true, uh, that we're in the last of the last days. But one thing is for sure, we're in the last days in terms of the biblical uh, definition of that. As it goes on in this, and it's going to basically say this uh, in our notes here, According to the Bible, the latter times or last days are the time period between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. All right, so we are between that time, aren't we? 
Uh, he's already come once. We believe in the future. He's coming again. We don't know when that is, but those days between the first and second coming of the Lord are called uh, the last days. And, and I give, uh, you'll see CF means confer or uh, check it out. Acts chapter 2 and verses 14 through 21. You remember uh, on that day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, that first day of Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus, uh, you know uh, that they were questioning, what is this about? They, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, people heard them speaking in other tongues, and they asked, what is this all about? And what did Peter do? Peter stood up and he quoted from the uh, prophet Joel, J-O-E-L, right? He quoted from the prophet Joel and said that, that this is that which the prophet Joel spoke about, that in the last days, God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh, right? And it goes on and says, your, your young men will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, etc. And upon your uh, uh, servants, handmaidens, I will pour out my spirit uh, in the last days. And so he, he says that on that day, all right, of the outpouring of the spirit of God, that that was the last days, right? He said that, as he quotes from Joel chapter 2, he says, and this is that fulfillment that in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And you know what? He's still pouring out his spirit on all flesh that will receive his spirit. Isn't that right? Amen? He hasn't stopped uh, pouring out or filling people with this Holy Spirit uh, that will receive the infilling of the Spirit of God. And so thank God for that. Now notice now, uh, this author, this book uh, called Bible Themes, Martin Manser, he confirms this. Just so you know, this is not just me making it up. He he writes this, the final epic of history, which is marked by the coming of the Messiah and the establishment of God's kingdom in the New Testament, it is portrayed this again. This is about the last days. OK, in the New Testament it is portrayed as the period between Jesus Christ's first coming and the consummation of all things at his return and is marked by godliness, godlessness and the persecution of God's people. All right, and so again, we are in the last days. We don't know for sure if we're in the last of the last days, but we've been in the last days. Uh, but praise God, uh, the last days there may be much persecution. Uh, there is probably going to be more persecution for those that are true believers in Christ. The Bible says that all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Uh, but also we need to realize the good news is that in the midst of the persecution, God's Spirit is going to continue to move mightily in God's people. Amen? And that we will receive not only an initial filling with the Holy Spirit, but He is, he is desiring to fill us uh, repeatedly. Uh, there's many fillings with the Holy Spirit. There's one baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, many fillings with the Spirit of God, and uh, we believe in God. Amen. Believe in God. He said uh, in Acts chapter 3, beginning with verse 19, he talks about uh, that, that Jesus will be retained in heaven, but until then, there will be seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord that until Jesus comes, he's going to be retained in heaven, but until he comes, there's going to be uh, seasons of refreshing from the presence of God. I'm believing God for a new season of refreshing. Amen? Amen. And so that's something that he's promised, a refreshing from the presence of God. Because, you know, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Whatever the devil does, God does that much more, doesn't he? Amen? Amen. And so as we read on with this, now notice it says in lowercase b after that, some will depart from the faith. So the Holy Spirit speaks expressly that in the last days there's going to be people departing from the faith. There were people departing from the faith uh, when Paul wrote this to Timothy. Uh, there were people departing from the faith throughout the 2,000 or so years since Jesus came. But thank God there's been more that have come to the faith than have departed from the faith, right? It does not say many will depart from the faith. It doesn't say most will depart from the faith. It says that some will depart from the faith. And so we understand that that is what the Bible teaches. And even though there are some that don't seem to adhere to that, we know the Bible makes it very clear. So let's read on with this. Uh, it says again, lowercase b, some will depart from the faith. Remember in chapter 3, the Apostle Paul refers to the church as, and this is from last week, he referred to the church as the pillar and ground of truth. That's in chapter 3, verse 15. And then proceeds to tell of some of the great truths of the gospel in verse 16. I'll just read them to you again. Verse 16 of chapter 3, he says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Then he goes on, God was manifested in the flesh. That's Jesus. Amen. God became a man. He was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. And so after having said all that, then he gives this warning about uh, the spirit saying there's going to be some that are going to depart from the faith. Uh, but let's read on in our notes here and see some other things with this, all right? 
And so we're after that, uh, where it says uh, verse 16, we'll read on. Now, Paul is warning, however, that there's going to be some who will depart from the faith or depart from the truth of the gospel. There's going to be many that are going to come to the gospel and believe on the gospel, but there's going to be those that are going to depart from the gospel. The word depart means to abandon a former relationship or association or to dissociate. It means to fall away, to forsake, to turn away. Even though there are some who believe in the doctrine, once saved, always saved, the Bible makes it very clear that this is not necessarily the case. And so it's so important, you know, there's a lot of scholars out there uh, that believe once a person is saved, they're always saved and there's no chance of apostasy. Well, I ask the question, what do you do with this verse of Scripture? I mean, I, I mean that sounds wonderful. I mean, I'd love to be able to say there's no, no uh, chance of apostasy. There's no chance of everybody losing their, anybody losing their salvation. But what do we do with that verse? And some other, quite a few other verses as well. In fact, I gave you uh, some of them. In fact, I'm going to have you turn because this opens up a lot of uh, uh, questions for people. And so hold your place there in 1 Timothy chapter 4. And let's go back here to Hebrews for a moment. Hebrews is going further toward the back of your Bible. So Hebrews uh, chapter 3 is where we want to go. And like I said, we're going to look at this only because, again, chapter 4 of 1 Timothy and verse 1 talks about people departing from the faith. And so uh, that makes people really wonder, well, what do we do about that? What do we think about that? And so I think it's important that we discuss it a little bit. And I know some of you have heard me share along this line before, uh, but we need to be reminded of these things. And then there's always people that are going to hear it for the very first time, right? And so it's important that we do understand this uh, to a certain extent. Now, let me give you a little bit of background here of this epistle to the Hebrews. The epistle to the Hebrews was written to, as you would probably imagine, uh, Jewish Christians, all right? Believers who ha are Jewish by race, they're Jewish by uh, 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 their, their ethnicity, but yet they had adhered to and accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They believed that Jesus was their Messiah, all right? But yet, as, as Jewish believers, because again, it's called Hebrews, right? So Hebrew believers or Jewish believers, as Jewish believers, they were being tempted, some of them were, they were being tempted to fall away from Christ. They were being tempted uh, to turn their back on Christ and go back to their Judaism. I mean, there was a lot of pressure for them uh, because some of them, you know, were being uh, uh, cast out of their families. They were being, you know, uh, you know, written off from their families, you know, uh, if you will, snubbed or, or whatever. And so, you know, some of their very family members were kind of disconnecting with them and everything. There's a lot of pressure on the Jews who had accepted Christ in many cases anyway. All right. So uh, some of them were drawing back. In fact, if you read the entire epistle to the Hebrews, you realize uh, that a lot of what's being said in Hebrews is about a warning to not draw back. Don't leave the faith. You know, stay confident in Christ. A lot of things that are said. We'll look at a few of those. But notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 3. And we'll start with verse 7. Are you there? Hebrews 3 and verse 7. It says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. The rebellion is speaking of the children of Israel when they rebelled against God after He delivered them from Egypt. Okay? And so He's warning them. He's warning these Hebrew believers. And see, again, one thing that the writer of Hebrews uh, did, being he was writing to Hebrew Christians, he would use Scripture from the Old Testament oftentimes to show his point or to prove his point, right? And so he said and referred back to Israel of the Old Testament. And he said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always do a, go astray in their heart and they have not known my way. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now notice verse 12. Beware, brethren. He's writing to Christian, Christians, Jewish Christians. He said, beware, brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in what? Departing from the living God. Now, you know that that corresponds with what we read in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, where it says the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall what? Depart from the faith. Here he's warning these Hebrew believers, do not depart from the living God by having an evil heart of unbelief. All right? And so as it goes on with this, now notice it says, in verse 13, 
but exhort one another or encourage one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And then it goes on, verse 14, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. And he goes on and says some other things about this. And so, uh, again, what's the idea here? It seems to be, as we look at this, and I'm going to look at a few other scriptures too for you, uh, but it seems like it's evident here that he's warning them about not entering into the sin of unbelief and that the sin of unbelief equates to departing from the living God. So faith gets you to God, right? Faith in what Christ has done. We place our faith in Christ. We accept Him as our Lord and Savior. We are saved on our way to heaven. But unbelief can get somebody out of their relationship with God. Faith gets you in. Unbelief can get you out. But how does unbelief come about? Well, it comes about, as far as we can see from this scripture, the deceitfulness of sin. Again, notice it says in verse 13, Uh, or excuse me, yeah, verse 13, but exhort one another today daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And so a hardened heart can take place. How does a hardened heart take place? It takes place by us not repenting of sin, by being deceived by sin, continuing in sin. It's It's not the action of a sin that will cause you to lose salvation, And really, we probably shouldn't use the word lose salvation because you don't lose salvation like you lose a set of keys or whatever, right? Uh, But you forfeit salvation. You can because you allow sin in your life to harden your heart and a hardened heart can say, I don't want Christ anymore. A hardened heart can say, I don't believe anymore, right? And so again, though, let me just say this to you. I think it's rare. I think most Christians, uh, they, they uh, start into sin. They get so convicted of their sin, they repent, and they ask God to forgive them, and, and they keep moving on. I think it's a rare thing. But basically, uh, faith gets you in. Unbelief can get you out. Uh, but the way unbelief comes in is by a continual time period uh, of hardening of the heart. It's usual. Uh, in fact, I would say it's always a gradual process of our heart being hardened uh, Uh, because we don't repent of sin. Does that make sense to you? All right, again, we know that this idea of falling away is biblical. It happens, all right? It's not God's will, but it does happen. And and so, again, uh, that's how I would understand that. Now, if we go uh, just a little bit further over to Hebrews 6 now, look at the 6th chapter of Hebrews, because as I mentioned to you, uh, you know, the Hebrew believers, some of them were being tempted to fall away, right? And there's so many scriptures that he warns about that, okay? He warns about not drawing back unto perdition and things like that. But notice uh, what it says. We'll start with verse 4 of Hebrews 6, okay? Are you there? Notice it says this, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, all right? Enlightened, that means they've received the light, I would say. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, 4 says, Uh, that uh, the God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them, right? And so again, they were once enlightened, and then it goes on, and have tasted the heavenly gift, and certainly the the heavenly gift, if we're going to look at other scripture, would be, in my understanding, would be the gift of eternal life, right? Eternal life is a gift, right? In Romans 6, it talks about, uh, you know, the, the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, right? It's either Romans 3 or Romans 6. You'll have to find it. You, you can find it. All right, but the heavenly gift would definitely be salvation. It's the gift of eternal life. And so it's impossible for those who were once enlightened. They receive the light. They taste the heavenly gift, salvation, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Some interpret that as being filled with the Holy Spirit. But either way, they got the Holy Spirit, whether it's new birth or otherwise, right? So they've been been partakers of the Holy Spirit, verse 5, and have tasted the good word of God, which kind of gives us the hint that they have some maturity to them, right? They've been taught the word of God. And so there's a a measure of maturity and the powers of the age to come. That could be referring to the gifts of the Spirit. Sometimes uh, authors will say that. Is everybody following me here? And then it says, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. And we could read on with that, but the idea is it's impossible for those who uh, meet those qualifications. It seems here that in Hebrews 6, it's talking about certain uh, qualifications that someone has to have had in order to truly fall away and not be able to repent. And so it's not just any uh, baby Christian. 
uh, that maybe, you know, uh, falls back into sin and what have you, but it's somebody who has uh, been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, uh, has the Holy Spirit, whatever measure that is, they, they have tasted the w- good word of God, which uh, infers at the very least that they've matured, they have a level of maturity, and, uh, and then they, on purpose, fall away. And let me just uh, emphasize this, nobody forfeits their salvation by accident. All right, it's not a, nobody can just forfeit it and by accident. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. No, anybody that does forfeit their salvation, they did it on purpose. They knew exactly what they were doing. Their eyes were wide open, and so nobody here has to be concerned. Oh, did I did I lose my salvation? No, you don't have to worry about that because if you're worried about it, then you didn't. Does that make sense? Right? All right, because again, uh, somebody that really has doesn't care anymore. Their heart is hardened. Right? When your heart is hardened, you don't care anymore. And there's no sense of remorse, no sense of any of that. And so you don't have to be concerned about that kind of thing. Does that make sense to you, right? Now, one last uh, passage, uh, and I know I'm, I'm doing this a long time, but that's okay because I think this is important for people, all right? But uh, in Second in, uh, Peter, and I think the reference I put on there for you, Second uh, Peter chapter 2, I did. And this talk about false teachers, but again, uh, it applies to those that once were saved. And so 2 Peter, and then we're going to go back to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and, and uh, do more of the notes, all right, because this is my last chance with you for a while. And so we've got to finish these notes, all right? So we go to 2 Peter uh, chapter 2. Are you there? All right, so notice now, uh, you know, it's talking about false teachers. You notice beginning with verse 18. Are you there? All right, so it says, For when they speak uh, great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. Verse 19. Well, they promise them liberty. Now, this is false teachers uh, teaching uh, error to believers and trying to draw them away. It says, While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. Now, notice, now, verse 20. For if... After they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, that's talking about somebody that's really saved here, right? I mean, it doesn't say, it doesn't say they, they attempted to escape the pollutions of the world. It says that they did escape the pollutions of the world, right? As a matter of fact, it did, it says, all right? And, uh, and, and, and through the knowledge of the Lord and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So they knew the Lord, right? They had knowledge of him. They are again entangled in them, in what? In the pollutions of the world. If they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Verse 21, for it would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness. That tells you they did know the way of righteousness, right? But it says, but it would have been better for them not to know the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. And so again, uh, you know, that shows real clearly that it is possible for someone to forfeit their salvation, right? But again, it's not, it's not common. I don't believe it's common. Uh, I believe it's rare. And I believe, I believe again that uh, the scripture makes it really clear that it's due to unbelief. And it doesn't just happen suddenly. It's over a process of unrepentant sin that someone's heart gets hardened, and then they basically say, I don't want Christ anymore, I don't believe in Him anymore. And again, I think that there's a need for qualifications like we saw in Hebrews chapter 6. Once enlightened, tasted of the heavenly gift, partakers of the Holy Spirit, of the powers of the ages to come, tasted the good word of God, right? And so it seems like, uh, again, uh, if if anybody questions it, if you have doubt about it, if you worried about it, you didn't, amen? Uh, and so it's never by accident that anybody forfeits their salvation. Does that make sense? All right, so having said all that, and again, I think it's important because I'll tell you, there are some out there that have, that have said, I, I mean, some of you might realize I've mentioned this, but you, you're hearing about it often nowadays, of those out there, especially, uh, especially I've read of some pastors that decided I'm not a Christian anymore. Well, if you really looked at their life, The ones that I'm thinking of, the ones that say I'm not a Christian anymore, they had a wrong view of God to start with. And and, and again, I don't want to belabor this thing about Calvinism, but the ones I'm thinking of, 
they saw God with a Calvinistic mindset, which basically sees God as the author of evil as well as good, and basically do not distinguish between Satan and God, because God is responsible for all the evil in the world as well. And so they have a wrong image of God. And I've often said, you know, and again, I'm thinking of some that have been Calvinists that are saying, I'm not a Christian anymore. And I'd say to them, you know what? You didn't leave Christianity. You left Calvinism because there is a big difference here. All right. And you know what? If I had believed or had an image of God like you have an image of God, I'd probably leave it too, you know. And so, again, they're confused. And unfortunately, uh, they don't often anyway, they don't realize, you know, they've had a wrong image of God. And so they've departed. And that's a very sad thing, isn't it? Right. And so again, and I would submit to you as we look at some of these scriptures, even though it's not, it's not delineated as far as that doctrine goes, uh, that that doctrine is a doctrine of demons as well. And uh, a lot of people disagree with that, but it doesn't matter because I've already shown you in the scripture many, many times how that it's so contrary to the word of God. And uh, people get blinded by things, you know, by their denominational mindset. And somehow it, it causes them to have blinders or something, you know, and they see things uh, through their denominational glasses, so to speak, and it perverts everything, and it's very sad. Anyway, uh, we better go on because I got on that soapbox again. All right, so let's go to number three. This is how they depart from the faith. It says, number three, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. All right, so the words giving heed, is everybody with me about halfway down page one? So the words giving heed are one word in the Greek and mean to hold the mind towards, that is pay attention to, be cautious about, apply oneself to and adhere to. And so they are what? Giving heed, adhering to, applying themselves to, paying attention to, all these kinds of things, the deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, as we go on, so the thing that precedes the departing from the faith is a person begins to pay attention to, listen and embrace deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And so if you hear about somebody who one time professed to be a Christian and now they're saying, I'm not a Christian anymore, don't let that upset you. As far as, you know, begin, don't begin to question your own Christianity just because you see somebody out there that's, that's saying that I'm not a Christian anymore, even if they're a theologian, because some of these theologians, you know, there is, there is this thought that a lot of those seminaries, you know, people go to seminary and sometimes they come out atheists because of what they've been taught in, in seminary. So don't let that move you. All right, don't let it move you. Just realize the Bible predicted that this would happen and know and remember that they gave heed and paid attention and adhered to seducing spirits or deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And no one is immune to that unless you take an immunization shot. Uh, and that is the word of God. Isn't that right? And so take your booster, get a booster every day. Get a booster in the word every day. Amen. And uh, that'll, you know, the, the remedy for deception is the Word of God, right? And so we got to make sure we stay in it and, and keep it forefront in our minds and in our hearts, all right? And so as we go on with that, notice now lowercase a, are you there? All right, so let's look at deceiving spirits. This shows forth the fact that there is a very real spiritual war that is occurring in our world. I'm going to pause there just for a moment. Realize now, you know, again, I go back to some of these pastors or Christian leaders that uh, have departed from the faith. Remember now, you know, because there is a war going on, they are, uh, you could say that they are, uh, 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 what's the word that I'm looking for? They, they are victims of war, all right? And they have fallen away many times because Satan knows in his deception that if he can get the leaders to depart, that many of the followers are going to say, well, if he doesn't believe anymore, why should I, right? And so again, it's just like a natural war. If you're going to, if you're going to take care of or in any way stop the enthusiasm, if you will, of the rest of the military, uh, you need to knock off the leader. And if you knock off the leader, the rest of them get a little uh, less brave. Isn't that right? And so, again, this happens even in the spiritual realm. We are at war. There's a war going on. And we're not talking about a natural war. We're talking about a spiritual warfare, right? And I know Jesus won it, but we have to appropriate it, right? We have to appropriate it. And so let, let's go on with this. And it reads this way. Uh, Jesus dealt with, and again, there's a war going on, a spiritual warfare. Jesus dealt with unclean spirits. Matthew 10, 1. In fact, I have some of these scriptures up here, if you don't mind. Uh, we'll just look at these real quickly because I, I'm running out of time, obviously. Uh, Matthew 8, 16. When evening had come, they brought to him, that's to Jesus, many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. And so spirits are real entities. 
You understand, right? There are real entities that are demonic spirits in this world. We don't have to fear them because we have authority over them, right? In Jesus' name. Jesus, that same Jesus who it says uh, uh, would cast out spirits with the word and heal the sick, that same Jesus is our Jesus and he dwells within us by the Spirit of God and we have that name, that authority is in his name, isn't it, right? So we don't have to fear these things, we just need to understand that they do exist. It's not a, some sort of fantasy type of thing. The Bible makes it clear that they do exist. When I was a missionary in Portugal, I saw them manifest several times. All right, and we had to deal with that and did deal with that because there's power in the name of Jesus. All right, and then how about this? Mark 1, 23 through 27. Now, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. Now, usually when it refers to an unclean spirit, which the Bible speaks of unclean spirits quite a bit, it's referring to sexually perverted type spirits, right? Unclean. And so impure spirits, we could say. And so now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. Well, again, Jesus dealt with them. Jesus was and is God, right? God has authority over demon spirits, and you and I are sons and daughters of God. And so in the name of Jesus, we have authority as well, right? And then, of course, Mark chapter 16, 17, it says, And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons, and they'll speak with new tongues, that verse 17 says. And so again, we have this idea that believers in that name have authority over these demon spirits, right? So we don't have to fear them. We don't need to be afraid of them. God doesn't want us to have a fear of them. He wants us to know that we have authority over them, right? They fear us. They fear Christians. You hearing what I'm saying? They fear believers. They fear Christians that have the word in their heart and the word coming out of their mouth. Because the word of God out of our mouth is like a sword, the Bible says, in Ephesians chapter 6, right? All right, so as we look back here at our notes now, it says again, Jesus dealt with unclean spirits. I gave those references. The Bible says, Philip, these are just a few examples. Philip cast them out in Acts 8, verses 4 through 8 in Samaria. And Paul cast out a spirit of divination. And so a, a spirit of uh, witchcraft or fortune telling is what that means. A spirit of divination. He cast that out of that girl, uh, uh, Paul did, in the name of Jesus. He cast that spirit of divination or that foretelling, that fortune telling spirit out of that girl in Acts 16, 16 through 18. Believers are told they'll cast out demons. We just read that verse of scripture. And we're told that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with wicked spiritual forces in Ephesians 6, 12. And so, you know, Ephesians 6, 12, we won't turn there because I'm running out of time. But in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, he begins to get into the armor of God, right? Verse 12 says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood or people, right? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness or wicked spirits in heavenly places, right? And so he mentions different rankings, perhaps, uh, of demonic spirits that we wrestle against. But then he tells us, uh, but, you know, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil. And, and see, when you put on the armor of God, and the armor of God, what is that? I don't have a lot of time. But the armor of God are different applications of his word. All right, so, you know, the breastplate of righteousness, you know, you find out your righteousness in the Word of God, right? Your right standing with God and standing on your right standing with God. You're righteous in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, right? He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made what? The righteousness of God in Christ. So we get really fortified in our right standing with God, our righteousness, because when we know we're righteous, uh, we stand up against the enemy, don't we, in Jesus' name, right? Uh, the, the helmet of salvation, you know, our minds renewed to the Word of God is so important with that. And, and our loins girt about with truth, you know, truth is God's Word. And, and when I think of the loins, you know, the loins are usually thought of as vulnerable areas, susceptible to being attacked, you know, weak areas, but we, we strengthen them with the truth of God's Word, right? And, and uh, you know, the, our feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, you know, uh, being walkers in the Word, walk in the Word of God, be a doer of the Word of God. And so the armor of God and the sword of the Spirit coming out of our mouth. Amen? 
and uh, speaking the word of God out of our mouth. All of these things are part of this, uh, this uh, coming against the enemy because there's a war going on, but thank God we've got victory. And you know, when you're wearing the armor of God, you know, it doesn't say your armor. It says the armor of God. The devil can't tell the difference between you and God because you're wearing his armor, right? All right, so let's go on with this now. After the reference given to Ephesians 6, 12, it reads on. In this case, the spirits referred to are called deceiving. In the case of 1 Timothy chapter 4, deceiving, which means misleading, leading into error. So people who depart from the faith are those who are deceived or led into error by false teachers being used of Satan. What is the remedy for deception? We know we must be lovers of the truth of God's word, right? Lovers of the word of God, not just people that, uh, you know, read the word of God, but loving the word of God. When you love the word of God, reading the word is not, is not a chore. When you love the word of God, reading the word becomes a pleasure. Isn't that right? Amen. And we're not going to turn there, but we read it when we went into Second Thessalonians, but it talked about deception and, and they were deceived. It's talking about the end times because they did not love the word of God. They did not love the truth. Okay. All right, let's go on with this. Lower case B. After uh, deceiving spirits, now doctrines of demons. Are you there? Doctrines of demons. What are doctrines? This word something means teaching or instruction. Paul is saying that demons have teaching, which would obviously be contrary to the teaching of the gospel. And, and all of you know, there's a whole lot of demonic doctrine out there right now, isn't there, right? There always has been. But I'll tell you, you know, this transgender ideology, that's, that's demonic doctrine right there. I mean, if there's anything that comes to my mind that's demonic doctrine, it is that transgender ideology that is ruining people's lives, destroying people's lives. And, and you know there's a whole bunch of others, and I can't get into it. I have quarter to eight already, and I haven't even gotten off page one, all right? And so, but you can think of doctrines of demons, can't you? There's a whole bunch of them out there. All right, so let's go on with this. Warren Wearsby writes this in the quote. Uh, this is the only place where demons are mentioned in the pastoral epistles. You remember the pastoral epistles are, uh, are uh, uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and really uh, 1 and 2 Thessalonians to some extent, but 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, okay, especially. All right, so uh, as we go on with this, in fact, uh, biblically, theologically, theologians call 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, they are the pastoral epistles. All right, so as we go on. It says this, this is the only place where demons are mentioned in the pastoral epistles, just as there is a, quote, mystery of godliness concerning Christ, which we studied last week. So there is a mystery of iniquity that surrounds Satan and his work. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. Satan is an imitator. If you went to 2 Corinthians 11, we're not going to take time. You'll see that uh, he is. And this basically tells some of the things. He has his own ministers, his own doctrines, and seeks to deceive God's people and lead them astray. The first test of any religious doctrine is what it says about Jesus Christ, right? I mean, that is the first test. You know, who is Jesus? That's one of the greatest tests as far as a cult, you know, a, a false teaching type of situation. Who do you believe Jesus is? And, uh, you know, what they believe about Jesus either makes it or breaks it. Isn't that right? Now, sometimes, though, you have to watch them. Because you know what? They will say things. They'll, they'll say things that are very similar to our wording, especially Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons in particular, uh, that sound so right sometimes, but yet not their meanings are not the same as our meanings. You understand, right? And so it's important for us to remember that as well. And so what did they do with Jesus? And how do they believe in him? He is what? He is God Almighty. He is Jehovah. The Jesus of the New Testament is Jehovah of the Old Testament, right? Jehovah became flesh and dwelt amongst us, right? Uh, the, the, God, the, the sinless one came, became a man to bear the sins of the others. Isn't that right? All right, so as we go on with this now, notice now down at the bottom of page 1, verse 2, uppercase B. And this, all right, we'll just read it. Speaking lies and hypocrisy having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. So hypocrisy uh, uh, is defined as to give an impression of having certain purposes or motivations while in reality having quite different ones, or to pretend. Pretend is a good, easy way to remember what hypocrisy is, right? To pretend, a pretender. To have one's conscience seared with a hot iron. Now remember, again, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. To have your conscience seared with a hot iron means to refuse to listen to one's conscience to be completely insensitive to. Another meaning is cauterized. That idea of seared, 
to have your conscience seared. It's like having, you know, your flesh is cauterized to take away, uh, you know, to stop it from bleeding sometimes in, uh, you know, uh, extreme situations or whatever, uh, you know, cauterization. What does it do, though? It deadens the nerves so that as it heals, now it's calloused, it's cauterized. There's no feeling. It's desensitized now, right? And so the idea as we read on with this then, uh, the complete biblical library adds some interesting thoughts. So now we come to page two. Thank God we made it to page two, right? All right. And so the, the complete biblical library, which is a great, it's a great uh, uh, couple of volumes. I only have one volume, but I'm going to get the other one one of these years. Uh, but it's a great uh, uh, commentary because for one thing, it's full gospel. It's uh, charismatic Pentecostal scholars uh, wrote that. And so it goes on top of page two. The human agents of these demons are found speaking lies and hypocrisy. False teachers were foretold by Jesus, Matthew 24, 11, Mark 13, 22. These hypocritical liars mentioned by Paul were probably early Gnostics. Now, don't uh, get all caught up about Gnostics. It's going to explain what a Gnostic was, and we still have them today to some extent. Probably early Gnostics who taught that spirit is altogether good and matter is totally evil. The word seared is the root for the word cauterize. Conscience is another important word in this first letter to Timothy. This is the fourth time it has appeared in chapter 1, verse 5, and then verse 19, chapter 3, 9, and then now in 4, 2. The idea of a seared conscience may mean their consciences have been branded with a hot iron to indicate ownership by Satan. Now, he's talking about the false teachers. And, and you know, that's the thing, you know, if you ever watch the Westerns, uh, you know uh, that, you know, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll brand their cattle, right? And that branding is the idea here also, this cauterizing or this hot iron type of thing. Their conscience is seared as with a hot iron, uh, which, you know, the branding of the cattle showed who the owners were, right? And so this is suggested by more than one scholar, not just this particular commentary, that possibly this being uh, uh, branded has the idea of now they belong to Satan, that they have given themselves over to him, and now he owns them, and they are propagating his doctrines, which are doctrines, as we said, of demons, right? And so that is possibly, at least in part, uh, the idea behind this having their conscience seared or cauterized or branded as with a hot iron. Are you following me on that? All right, and so letter C, uppercase C, verses 3 through 5. He goes on, now he begins to mention some of these doctrines. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. All right, so number one, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods. Now Paul begins to mention some of the, quote, doctrines of demons, which were being propagated by the false teachers of that day. This certainly doesn't mean that there are, these are the only false doctrines being taught, then or now. You understand that, right? These are samplings uh, of ones that were predominant, probably, going on there and being propagated there in that church at Ephesus, because Timothy, of course, was one of the leaders at that point in Ephesus, right, at the church at Ephesus. And so you remember that from the beginning. And so these things were things propagated there foremost, but that doesn't mean they're the only doctors of demons. We know there's a whole slew, uh, a, a bunch of others. Isn't that right? All right. And so as it goes with this, then we look at this, first of all. All right. So number one, uh, where were we? Okay. All right. We come to scholars differ. The, the last sentence prior to the quote in number one, scholars differ as to what these two things are referring to. Dr. Norman Geisler writes this. The apostasy of 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3 is a particular kind of apostasy. You remember, apostasy is the falling away, right? Or departing from the faith. It's a particular kind of apostasy related to Gnostic dualism. Now, don't get caught up with that word. We're going to explain it. This school of thought said, and here it is. This is what Gnostic dualism is. This school of thought said, spirit is good and matter is evil. Apparently, there were some false teachers who believed that all appetites relating to the material body, including sex and food, were evil and should be avoided. I don't know how they avoided food, but certain foods. Hence, these false teachers forbade people to get married and ordered them to abstain from certain foods. All right? And so, again, the idea there by Geisler and other scholars, in fact, the majority of the scholars I read after said that this was symptoms, if you will, of this Gnostic dualism, this Gnostic uh, ideology that was trying to infiltrate the church, uh, saying that anything spirit is good, but the physical is bad. And, you know, those very Gnostics, they rejected the idea of Jesus rising from the dead physically. 
They reject it. How many of you know you're supposed to believe that Jesus rose from the dead physically in order to be saved? Isn't that right? Romans 10, 9 and 10. And so these Gnostics, uh, they were treading in dangerous ground. These false teachers were actually totally against the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ because they could not accept the idea that anything that having to do with physical could be good. But we know better than that. Isn't that right? Is everybody following me on this, right? And so this Gnosticism was, was false doctrine, emphasizing anything spirit. And so, you know, you think about it, you know, you think about some of these things, forbidding to marry, and, uh, you know, I thought of, you know, I don't know, you know, we live around this area where there used to be the Shakers, right? Albany Shaker Road, right? The Shakers, you know, the Shakers, uh, as I recall in my mind, uh, they were sort of an offshoot, if I recall right, of the Quakers. And, and, you know, the Shakers, they didn't believe in marrying or having any kind of sex. And I want you to know that's why there are no Shakers today. You understand that, Right. If you have that doctrine, none of that, there's no more shakers. The shakers are gone. And we understand why, don't we, right? All right. And so, you know, forbidding to marry, forbidding to have sex because everything physical. How many of you know, though, God said that sex between a husband and a wife, you know, a biological man and a biological woman married together in a commitment of marriage, uh, having children is a good thing, right? Right. All right, and so again, this is contrary to the Word of God, contrary to all these things, and so again, it's, it's false doctrine. And then abstaining from foods. Now, this possibly, now I look at the next quote here because of time. Uh, Dr. Craig Keener offers a slightly different view, just slightly, it's probably related. And he said, asceticism, are you there with me? Asceticism, asceticism was on the rise in the Greco-Roman paganism. And although most teachers, both Jewish and Gentile, advocated marriage, the value of celibacy was becoming more popular, especially among Gentiles. But some Essenes, which was a, a Jewish sect, uh, Essenes, uh, some Essenes also seem to have practiced it. Abstaining from foods probably refers to Jewish food laws. And so, you know, we, we know that uh, that probably has some validity to it as well uh, because we already saw in chapter 1 and verse 7 of 1 Timothy that some of this false teaching did have to do with trying to mix the law with the grace of God. And we know that that cannot work, right? And so it probably was true uh, that some of these false teachers, maybe all of them, they were maybe mixing some of this Gnosticism with some of the Jewish law. And with the Jewish law, the food laws, of course, you know, don't eat any pork, uh, you know, uh, you know, and a lot of other things that were involved with that, no lobster, no lobster, no shrimp, you know, none of that kind of thing. You know, they had certain food laws that they restricted, and apparently some of that was trying to be imposed upon the Christian church. But Paul is saying that every creature of God is good. Now, there's some that are better for you than others, isn't there? But nevertheless, again, not a legalistic thing. Now, for health reasons, we may want to pick and choose what kind of food we eat. But for religious reasons, there's not any restriction in that regard. You understand, right? And so, again, the idea, and there's some groups even today, I think of the Seventh-day Adventists, you know, they're very strict in their food codes, right? And if you're not careful, I'm not saying that they're this way for sure, but there probably are some. And you can get this caught up with anybody. I've, I've run across it in churches like ours where people uh, become vegans. And for some reason, they think they're more spiritual because they only eat vegetables. I think they're carnal eating vegetables only. I think something's wrong with that thinking completely. But, uh, you know, uh, but my, I, my thinking is this. What we eat or don't eat does not determine our spirituality, Right. It doesn't t determine our spirituality, love, the love of God, walk in the love walk. That's the measure of spirituality. The fruit of the Spirit is the measure of spirituality, not what we eat or don't eat. But some folks do get caught up with, you know, because I'm on this, uh, you know, restriction of certain meats or certain foods or whatever the case may be, uh, they try to uh, appear or think of themselves as more spiritual. But that is not biblical, and that actually uh, comes out to be spiritual pride. Isn't that right? Spiritual pride. And see, they try to project that on others. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it never worked on me, but they try to project that on others, you know. I mean, people try to, over the years, try to make me a vegan. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I need meat. I, I like meat, all right? Uh, but, uh, but anyway, you know, and I've got scripture for it. We just read it. We're going to read it again. But notice here, number two. Foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good. Hallelujah. And nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. 
This particularly was applicable for those who were attempting to impose Jewish food laws onto the new believers. As we saw in the beginning of this letter, some of the false teaching did have to do with mixing in Jewish law. I've already mentioned that. The need for the giving of thanks for one's food is emphasized twice here uh, in that particular passage. And then you can also see Genesis 1.31. Uh, We're talking about God created all the animals and he said it was good. And then in Genesis 9, 3 is when he actually instituted the eating of meat after the the ark, after Noah's ark and then the settling of the ark and everything. And then Romans uh, 14 and verse 6 uh, talks about, you know, I think that's the scripture that talks about not judging in our meat or drink and all that kind of thing. You follow what I'm saying? And, And so again, you know, if you're, you know, I'm not saying you should go around, you know, eating a lot of bacon. But I am saying that it's not a matter of your spirituality or not. You you follow what I'm saying? I have bacon in my freezer. I just want you to know right now, okay? But, you know, again, everything in moderation, right? Everything in moderation as far as that goes. So, uh, anyway, oh, it's 8 o'clock. But let's keep going. We'll finish this. Is that all right? All right. So we come to this quote, uh, or actually it's the New Living Translation of 1 Timothy 4, 3 through 5. It reads this way. They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods. This is uh, from a different translation, right? They, being the false teachers, will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods. But God created those foods to be eaten with thanks by faithful people who know the truth. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. For we know it is made acceptable by the word of God and prayer. And so again, uh, you know, pray over your food. Give thanks for your food. I'll tell you, my wife... Uh, chuckles, but she knows every time we go to a restaurant. Remember, I used to be an exterminator going to a lot of restaurant kitchens. When we go to a restaurant, I always pray, Father, thank you for this food. I pray you bless it to our bodies and nothing in it will kill us or make us sick in Jesus' name. Amen. I always pray that uh, because it's not going to kill us or make us sick and it's not going to make us, it's not going to kill us gradually either, right? In Jesus' name. So we pray over that food because again, I've been in a lot of restaurant kitchens. All right, let's go on. All right, we won't mention any particular ones, though. All right, so so as we go on with this, now notice now we come to verse 6, letter D. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. Paul exhorts Timothy to, quote, instruct the brethren in these things, unquote, regarding what is and is in good doctrine. Instruct them in what is good and what is not good doctrine. If he does, he'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ. The word minister is better translated as the word servant. So for Timothy to be a good servant of Jesus Christ, he needs to teach the believers about the false doctrines that were being promoted and instead teach good doctrine. And then it says being nourished in the words of faith. Refer to Timothy. It's not referring to him nourishing them in words of faith. It's referring to Timothy being nourished in words of faith so that as he is nourished, he can nourish others, right? And so, you know, you can't nourish anybody else if you have not been nourished uh, in the Scripture, right? In the Word of God. And so as it reads on, notice the, the NET or the New English Bible helps us in understanding this particular verse. It reads this way, by pointing out such things to the brothers and sisters, you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus, having nourished yourself on the words of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. And so, again, he'll be a good servant instructing others because he already has having nourished himself in the word of faith, right? In the words of faith. And so, again, remember, some will what? Depart from the faith, but we want to be nourished in the faith and be able to nourish, nourish others in the faith as well, right? so that none will depart from the faith. And so now we come uh, to verse 7, and we'll close this out. And he says, But reject profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourself toward godliness. So, number one, the word profane means pertaining to being profane in the sense of worldly or godless, uh, whatever, worldly or godless. And then old wives' fables can be translated silly myths, stories old women told to children. Don't be offended, ladies. It's just, I'm just reading from the Bible, all right? I, I, I didn't write it. I'm just reading from it, all right? Now, Lord have mercy. I thought about, that's a terrible, uh, I need a different translation. But anyway, so, so we read here uh, this last portion here, which is from Warren Wiersbe. He writes this. These are, of course, the false teachings, these profane and old wives' fables, These are, of course, the false teachings and traditions of the apostates. Remember, apostates are those who have fallen away. These doctrines have no basis in Scripture. In fact, they contradict the Word of God. They are the kind of teachings that silly people would discuss, not dedicated men and women of the Word. But you and I are dedicated men and women of the Word. Amen? 
No doubt these teachings involve the false doctrines just named in 1 Timothy 4, 2, and 3. Paul also warned Titus about Jewish fables in Titus 1, 14. And Paul warned Timothy about these same fables in his second letter, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 4. So we could say that he's talking about silly myths. You know, uh, uh, reject silly myths. You know, you know, don't think that there aren't things that are being taught today. You know, I was just reading an article, and, and some of those out there in the charismatic circles, and we're, we believe in the charismata, we believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but some of them out there, so-called prophets or prophetesses, are really teaching some weird things, okay? And we need to be discerning. I, I wrote a couple of them down, uh, you know, uh, you know, this one woman that claims to be a prophetess, she's saying that there, you know, she's had a vision of heaven and there's portions of heaven made out of gelatin. Uh, gelatin? Is that a silly myth or what? I mean, that's ridiculous. Uh, you know, I read a book and some people may not think this is wrong. They talk about these uh, uh, mar- mar- marine spirit, marine demons, M-A-R-I-N-E, water demons. Forget about water demons. They get all caught up with that. Where's water demons in the Bible? I mean, you know, they just get up, caught up with these silly things. And, and this same woman that I was talking about, about, you know, parts of heaven being made a job. I'm talking about a woman that's well known in America. I never heard of her, but people have heard of her and they follow her. And, and she talked about, you know, her vision of her vision of, of uh, her vision of, uh, of uh, heaven. And, and she saw Santa Claus. I want you to know Santa Claus. Now, St. Nicholas might be in heaven, but not as Santa Claus. You understand, right? This is full of silly myths, silly myths. And then, you know, another one talked about, uh, you know, seeing in heaven all these things. You know, I don't know. I'll tell you, you wonder if they've been smoking something. You understand what I'm saying? But seeing in heaven, you know, uh, you know, cows driving tractors. Foolish stuff. Silly stuff. Let's not let's reject those things. Reject those things. And, you know, I know now now I might step on somebody's toes, but I'm real leery of things like, you know, even teaching about blood moons and stuff. People get off on that. Now, I know in the, you know in the coming of the Lord, the moon's going to turn red, and we've seen eclipses. where, they, But, you know, people get off too much on these things. Do you understand? They, they go too far uh, with some of this. And so we need to just be wary of that and just stay, stay stable, stay constant, stay consistent, stay steady, right? And, and don't be, you know, one tossed to and fro that Paul warns about in Ephesians chapter 4. You know, he talks about so that we not be children, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and sleight of hand and cunning craftiness, whereby men lie and wait to deceive, the scripture says, right? And so we don't want to be those that are tossed to and fro. We want to stay steady. And the way we're going to stay steady is stay in the word. And, uh, you know, don't throw your brain away. God gave you a brain. And so sometimes, you know, Christians, they throw their brain away. And, uh, you know, don't throw your brain away. Uh, God gave you a brain. Have it sanctified, renewed by the Word of God, right? Your mind. And, and, you know, stay steady. Anyway, so that closes it for tonight and for the next few weeks.